Welcome to the Peak to Peak Charter School 2021 Annual Meeting. I'm Heather Caruso, representing the Board of Directors and presenting some of the slides for you today. We want to first thank our community for an immense amount of support that you have provided during an extraordinarily challenging and novel year. We are excited to present what the annual meetings details are, but also looking forward to a new time as we surf through the pandemic into 2021 to 2022. The purpose of the annual meeting is required by the bylaws and standard practice for charter schools. This is to give you an overview of what this presentation will include. We'll have the welcome, the EDE update, elementary highlights, middle school highlights, high school highlights, EDO update of operations, board member recognition, and election information. The current board of directors includes seven volunteer voting board positions and board members who are administrators that are ex officio board members. Our current president is Colleen Elliott, Heather Caruso, who is speaking as the vice president, Evelyn Grady is the secretary, Thomas Willetto is the treasurer. We also have Ari Axelrod and Elizabeth Gable as our voting bo board members. Our non voting board members include Kelly Reeser as the executive director of education, Sam Todd, the executive director of operations, Melissa Christensen, our elementary principal, Clara Quinlan, our middle school principal, and Kyle Matthews as the high school principal. So to provide the board update, the oversight and functions, including the mission and vision of the board, include policy, budget, and curriculum, strategic plan and KPIs, as well as committees, which include finance and budget, curriculum, accountability, hiring, volunteer, as well as our ad hoc committees, elections, fundraising, City of Lafayette, and BBSD. Additional information for board updates is the focus of our year. Our focus of the year, including governance, is assessing peak to peaks needs to ensure that our bylaws and structures support the current direction of the school's mission, that are in alignment with best practices for effective charter school governance and are balanced by legal and regulatory requirements. Complete assessment and development that are recommended, uh, including recommended changes and action plans are needed by March, 2021. In response to the listening campaign and to support the implementation of our strategic plan, we actively drive to support peak to peaks fund development program, which focuses on external resources as evidenced by increased engagement and partnerships with external organizations. We also want to build board level relationships with BVSD to support positioning peak to peak for effective 2025 contracting and improve funding decisions between BVSD and charter schools. So what's next? We want to assess pandemic learnings and effects on K through 12 education partner with ELT on updates to the strategic plan, continued action on identified focus areas, and onboarding of new board members. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Reeser. I'm the Executive Director of Education at peak to peak and I'm very happy to um, be part of this annual meeting presentation and to provide some highlights and updates for you uh, about the year. That we have had. Um, what a year. It's been quite the adventure for all of us. I think everyone's had um, a, quite a year of disruption and challenges and with that is also some opportunities to learn new things and to uh, come together as a staff and a community to to really get through the, um, this very difficult year of, of operating a school in a pandemic. Um, along the way we've had a lot of learning that has happened and a lot of opportunities to to work together to develop new structures, new schedules, and um, all along the way, I can say that our staff, I'm really proud of the way 
that they handled um, this year. Their focus has always been on the students and what's best for the students and their learning and instructional best practices to keep um, students learning, even though this year has just been um, very challenging, really, to deliver high quality education. Um, but I'm proud of our staff and our, and our community and the way that um, we have come through this year. We have learned a lot. And um, we've been working really closely with Boulder Valley School District and also the Boulder County Health Department in designing our um, schedules and our um, ways of working together so that we're operating school as safely as possible. So I just want to express my appreciation for everyone who has uh, pitched in and helped and um, been flexible. I think flexibility has been the key word of the year and really proud of, of how we've been able to uh, remain flexible and, and keep moving ahead. Um, that said, so another big area of focus this year was our professional development program. Um, we provided very targeted support for our staff in terms of the distance learning structures and technology um, platforms and tools and learning together. So we provided a lot of um, actual uh, tech tools and also time to work together for teachers to share shops so that they could learn from each other learn from um, some of the vendors of those products that we were able to use this year. So in that way, it's been a very strong year of learning, um, sort of a forced situation with the, with the um, hybrid learning environment that we found ourselves in, but uh, also some things that we'll be able to take forward and use as we move ahead. Um, and two other areas of focus for our professional development, we're continuing with equity literacy for all staff and then social emotional learning and supports um, for teachers. So at the beginning of the year, all of our instructional staff did self-select into one of those two groups, which is equity or social emotional learning. And um, it's been a very eventful year with both of those strands of working groups and um, people setting goals and working together to really do some great professional learning. Um, the equity literacy piece has been particularly um, impactful and we have tried to include all of our staff not just instructional staff so this year we had quite a few sessions for um, support staff and other uh, types of our staff that uh, are, aren't typically involved in professional development so that's another area that i'm really pleased to see came together and I, the feedback that i've gotten from staff about those opportunities has been great um, social emotional learning again teachers got together to uh, discuss best strategies and really come up with um, innovative ideas for supporting students uh, with their social emotional growth. So next year, as we look ahead, we're looking at ways that we can combine those two strands into one. Um, all that work is still in progress, so we'll have more to report uh, as we get closer to the beginning of next school year. But it's very exciting in the ways that we're taking all of the learnings that teachers and, and other staff are sharing with us and coming up with uh, a new approach for next year that will be reflective of what they want to learn and and their targeted uh, professional development goals. And then we're also, um, towards the end of this year, we're able to push out some of the equity literacy topics to our community and get some community engagement with parents and, and other um, staff members in our equity work. So we've had uh, quite a few Digest articles. If you've been watching the Digest, we have had um, a Q&A session that we ran for um, parents and guardians who would who wanted to attend. We've done a few board presentations um, so that the board can understand exactly what's going on as well. So I, I anticipate that we'll have more of that as we move forward. We continue to more, move forward with the third year of our focus on equity literacy at peak to peak So look for more information to come. We do have a new um, page on our website that describes the work that we're doing and um, houses all the articles. So if you missed those in the digest, you can go back and read those. Those are some big highlights. If we look ahead to next year, um, I want to just highlight that we were we have, like I said, done a lot of learning about in this pandemic year. I want to take all of the things that we have learned and use that as we move forward. We've had, um, you know, a lot of challenges along the way, but also some. Like I said, some good things that have come out of this, and so we'll be able to use some of the things that we've been learning into next year. As we look ahead to next year, we are planning for a, a return to full-time in-person learning next year. We don't anticipate having a distance learning option 
as something that um, can be chosen. Um, we will be working again with Boulder Valley and also the health department to make sure, again, as we start school in the fall, that we're doing so in the safest way possible. And um, the exact protocols that we'll need to have in place in the fall are yet to be determined, but we'll begin working with um, the Department of Health and, and Boulder Valley with that, we'll continue those relationships. Um, we're aware that we're gonna need to do a lot of assessing. Um, students have had a very tumultuous, challenging year, so we'll be doing a lot of assessing of where are students and what do they need and where are the gaps and how do we go about addressing those. And I think as, as I can say peak to peak, as, as a K-12 school, we're in a unique position to be able to really quickly address um, any gaps that are identified because we are K-12, our teachers work very collaboratively across the grade levels, and so we'll have great opportunities for teachers to working together. And I think that that's already happening right now as we're planning for next year, we're looking at master schedule, teachers are already working together in grade level teams and department teams um, to understand kind of where uh, each course and, and each um, student is, and so we know where to pick up or that following year. So you're in a great place at Peak to Peak. With that, um, it's not, we're not in a unique position there. I think all over the country and all over the world, actually, this is something that educators are aware of and will be looking at. Um, so it is already happening at Peak to Peak. So it's gonna be fine. And I just wanna reassure everybody that we have got a fantastic staff that is well-equipped to come through and um, put some supports in place that are needed. And along those lines, too, providing that emotional and social emotional support for students because we do realize that it's been a very disruptive year. Um, routines are going to need to be reestablished. Um, we're going to have to make sure students know how to move around the buildings and just reacquaint them with how, how does it feel to be in school um, in a normal setting. So we're excited about those things, though. And again, our staff is well equipped to do that work and they are already very much, it's very much top of mind with staff. Um, strategic plan will continue to be something that we use at the leadership level to guide our work and our plans for the future and our goal setting. And we'll be looking at um, ways to revamp the strategic plan and you know, tweaks that are needed and, and ways that we can revise that going forward. Um, We've gotten a lot of parent and guardian feedback throughout the year, especially at the end of the year, the family survey that we administered through the accountability committee um, provided a lot of great feedback. We had a record high um, response rate this year, which is wonderful, and a lot of feedback that we'll be able to take and, and use as we incorporate um, our, into our plans for next year. So, And then just want to end on a note of optimism. So I think the return to school, it's very exciting to think about that. Everyone on staff is very excited to do that. There's a sense of optimism and a sense of renewal, really, about returning to campus as we know it and school as we know it. So I'm very excited about that, and I know I can speak for the staff as well, that they're very excited to see students back, and we're really looking forward to making a fresh start next year. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Melissa Christensen. I'm the elementary principal, and I'm going to continue sharing some highlights of this year and where we're going in the future. It wouldn't be a summary of the year without talking about distance learning. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things you might have forgotten or not been so aware of that we were able to do this year as we implemented distance learning, particularly at the beginning of the year. Um, one of the things we used was engagement coordinators, which were some of our staff members who reached out to families whenever a student was struggling, whether that be with technology or the schedule or the workload, so that we could make sure and keep as many students engaged and attending and participating as possible. We had very high levels of engagement, and we believe part of it is a result of that. But our engagement coordinators would partner with families to make sure that they had the things and the tools that they needed to meet all of the other things that we were doing. We worked to make adjustments based on feedback we received from families through surveys and meetings. And then when most of our students returned in January to in-person learning, uh, about 125 of our students' families chose to stay home for distance learning. And so we assigned certain teachers to work with the distance learners and other teachers to work with in-person learners because that was the most effective way for these distance learning students to continue to learn. Based on all of the benchmark data that we have where we can compare previous years to this year, we had very high levels of achievement and growth 
for reading and math in some of our other areas. So even though it was an atypical year in ways that none of us would choose, we do feel that our students were learning and growing and we're gonna carefully be monitoring that data as we move forward. Once uh, January hit, most of our, our students were able to return to in-person learning. Um, prior to that time, our kindergartners were able to start at the beginning of the year and we had some small group cohorts that were able to work at school and receive some additional support in January. We brought the majority of our students back to campus and we prioritize the time that they spend on campus to be for reading and math and core content areas. Uh, obviously, they don't have lunch, they don't have extra recesses and other transition times, they don't have specials in person. But by focusing that time on the reading and math and other priority areas, we were able to almost get to the same amount of time for those content areas that they would have received had they been in school in a regular schedule. And so we feel really good about that. And that it might be one of the reasons why our students are still learning and achieving at high rates. And then looking forward to what we're going to do in the future, we're very much looking forward to next August when we'll be able to have full classrooms with all of our students in person again. And we're working now to make that transition a little easier for our students. We're doing things to partner current grade with a future grade teacher to do some question and answer, some virtual tours of classrooms and buildings so that the students know what to expect and how to expect it. As you've already heard, social and emotional supports are something that are going to be really important and we're working on specific strategies that we can implement, such as a daily morning meeting and community building activities to help students in each class and then in each grade and then as an elementary school and a K-12 to feel the support that they need to address their mental health needs. We're gonna be receiving some trauma-informed trainings and some strategies for teachers to implement with students to make sure that as we return from this pandemic, we're addressing those needs, giving them extra time to socialize, giving them strategic, um, opportunities to, to learn and grow together. And then our academic responses are also something that we're talking a lot about and wanting to make sure that we are really closely attuned to any gaps that might have grown or existed prior to and, and widened now through this pandemic year when not anything was normal. Um, we're looking at the way we provide interventions to make sure that we're getting as many students as possible the help they need. We're talking about ways that the classroom setup and instruction might need to change for a little bit to make sure that we're addressing things that students might not have had the opportunity to learn or not learn as much as they otherwise would have. So that by the end of next year, everybody is, is as close to where they need to be as possible. And we're closely gonna be monitoring our end of year data we're collecting right now. And then next year's beginning of year data to make sure we're addressing those specific areas that each individual student and, and collectively as a group would need to have. Those are our biggest priorities. We're really looking forward to what the future holds for us. I'm going to send it on over to middle school. Thanks for paying attention. Hi, my name is Clara Quinlan. I just took the middle school principal position on in January. I'm so happy to be with a new team. And I was previously the high school assistant principal. And then previous to that, a ninth grade English teacher. And I welcome those of you that I know and those of you that I will start to get to know in my new role. For the middle school highlights this year, from August to December, our instruction was largely guided by summer task forces. So in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, we got an extraordinary amount of feedback and insight from surveys given to our staff, to our students and our families about what was really needed. Should we persist with a distance learning platform and um, what was lacking and the gaps and some of the inequities that we wanted to address as we moved into what looked to be like it would be a pandemic year, which actually it proved to be. So those summer task forces topics were instructional framework and delivery, equity support, sixth and ninth grade transitions, and social emotional learning. And I'm really proud of our team this year, K through 12, and specifically the ones that I've worked with in just putting in an extraordinary amount of energy and time in order to deliver the very best of what we know grows students in our challenges this year. In collaboration with content and grade level teams, essential learning objectives were identified and prioritized in curriculum. Later on in this presentation, you will likely hear us reference that we plan on returning to this in the fall and looking at our data and monitoring it closely so that we can um, identify gaps that we would like to address and also content that 
was truly delivered at a level um, that might even surprise all of us this year and that our students were learning with so that we can be as adaptive as possible to our returning students and also our open enrollment students, specifically the kindergarten six and ninth grade level. We really hit the ground running with some innovative models, an engagement tracker that was originally brought forth by the middle school team in the spring of 2020 and was adopted across the secondary platform in which not only did we take attendance with students, but we really monitored, um, were they engaging with their classes with distance learning? That was everything from talking in class to the chat box, to turning cameras on, to turning work in, and then we responded afterwards to needs from there. We also noted that our homework completion and our assessment pro performance remained high, as did our attendance and engagement. And again, we will be continuously monitoring data as it comes in and also some assessment work this fall to figure out where we should be taking next steps with that. And then also starting in October at the middle school level, there is in-person academic support for identified students in the greatest need during the afternoons. As we moved in January through May and we received word that we would be allowed to have more students on our campus, um, our leadership team, our facilities team, our board, our staff members really worked diligently to see how much space we could access, how many students we could support, and then also keeping in mind those families in distance learning as well. So we decided to do a sixth grade pilot in what we were calling quarter three, starting in January, late January. We brought any sixth grader who wanted to come to in-person afternoon enrichment experiences. And this included a web orientation program. And that was exciting for us as half of our sixth grade community is brand new to peak to peak So they were able to come on campus uh, if safety allowed and family choice was there. We also ran that in conjunction with morning instruction because we found that about 50% of our learners and families were ready to send students back and the other 50 were remaining in distance learning. We also offered full day support to identified sixth through eighth grade students and we did afternoon study sessions for seventh and eighth grade students as well. So we were serving about maybe 150 to 200 students. Uh, at certain points in quarter three and really keeping our eyes forward on what it might look like to bring more learners back. So in March, all sixth and eighth graders who were given the option, or I'm sorry, were given the option to attend in-person learning or continue in distance learning. And you can see the percentages there of those who have opted in and opted to stay at home. I'm really proud of the middle school staff. They decided to go forward with some social emotional supports and connections embedded in each lesson really um, led by some of the work that our two counselors did to give them those necessary supports. And we continue to offer now in-person office hours, connection activities, and also we're planning actively for our eighth grade continuation ceremony that all signs point to should be an in-person celebratory experience that we will be aligning in day uh, with our fifth grade continuation ceremony as well. And Truly looking forward to moving toward that August goal of coming back fully in person. Priorities for the next school year, I've just said it now, um, it's really welcoming all of our learners back and delivering the kind of instruction relationships that we're really founded on and we know that we can do well. I've also mentioned that we'll be monitoring data and looking at those assessments in the fall to be as responsive as possible to each individual learner's needs while also tracking some trends. We've got some new and expanded courses at the middle school, the transitions and then the Thrive program. If you haven't seen the I Am Me video that came out with the Thrive program, it was a pretty powerful uh, social emotional response to some stigmas in our community about mental health and, and really had staff and students engage with that. We have a new nutrition and kitchen chemistry and an intro to engineering and design that we're very excited to offer our middle school learners as we continue to challenge them to be innovative, to take risks on the way to learning and um, to be a community in which we support each other. We're also refining some student support structures in our literacy and math interventions and coaching and our multi-tiered systems of support. 
The middle school team has been talking actively also about increasing student voice and agency in some of the school decision making and programs within our school. And so everything from some lunch squads to additional leadership and services opportunities. We even have some students who are coming forward with some great ideas about the announcements and the bulletin boards and really trying to make it a community in which the students really feel a sense of ownership in the culture that we are creating. We're also going to be prioritizing social connections and support in response to this pandemic year. So just this week, coming off of the middle school staff meeting where we took some time to really think about our targets for growth and character in each of the grade levels, the mentorship of our older students to our younger students, and what it means for us to be coming from very different narratives and experiences this last year and reconnecting together as a school community under a common mission and vision and goal. We're also going to be expanding our character development program over the next few years. We'd like it to, while we value our IROR program, we wanna move beyond that to really authentically embrace other characteristics that we know matter as far as life skills and character traits. We are introducing some really exciting new field trips and events already next year and looking at a vertical student teaming model where as students enter our middle school as sixth graders, they will be rising through different challenges and growth opportunities on their way to eighth grade where they'll really get to um, take their own particular leadership and service steps and some risks for their own growth as they get ready for high school. Good evening, Kyle Matthews. I'm your high school principal. Very proud to see, uh, see you all here tonight, and thanks for, for joining us for our annual meeting. Uh, give you some quick updates, uh, highlights from this year uh, at Peak to Peak. Well, a couple of big things that uh, we worked on this spring, uh, of course, was the big shift. Uh, start off in distance learning. Staff had to make some major course corrections uh, last spring over the summer. Uh, to adjust to an online environment. Um, teachers compacted their curriculum, so we still got all the priorities in, uh, the essential elements for each course, and it involved a lot of vertical collaboration uh, from one course to the next to make sure uh, that all the content that we plan to get addressed gets addressed and we carry over things into next year. Um, collaboration and research between teachers, they did a lot of sharing of best practices, uh, use of new technology, uh, like Nearpod uh, and other uh, No Red Ink and other tools that really help students uh, make the changes they need to be successful. They access the breakout rooms, they implemented creative feedback mechanisms, uh, use Google Voice, um, a lot of sharing and uploading into Google Classroom and such. Um, the neat thing that we were surprised to see was engagement levels were so high, even though we were in distance learning. Attendance was really strong. Uh, throughout the year higher than previous years. And task completion was particularly high uh, with distance office hours and support cohorts in place in the afternoons. Well, as we shifted, uh, made plans from January through February to get ready for March, uh, we got ready for in-person uh, instruction. And so grades nine to 12 returned to campus uh, right before spring break. Teachers uh, were trained and, and, and got used to using their Revis camera systems and in April and May focused on uh, our connections with students and finishing strong. Uh, I'm really pleased with how effectively the teachers were able to, to work with multiple audiences at the same time uh, to foster uh, growth for students who are at home and in the classroom. Uh, neat highlights this spring, we have a field event uh, that's going on for ninth graders, uh, some fun activities and ice cream and such outside. Focus again on finishing with relationships uh, think about our, our innovative uh, classes that we've had this year and our thinking skills and challenges, particularly with our innovation class, uh, first year seminar with Ms. Letter. And we are planning our trip to Camp Timberline for October in 2021 uh, for this year's freshman class because they missed it this fall. Uh, the 10th grade just had their ice cream social and, and soccer uh, field outing uh, just really recently on a nice day. Uh, their focus this year has been on service, practicing their leadership in things like uh, student council clubs, honor societies, national honor society, 
and applying their skills to projects. So a big year of growth for our 10th graders. 11th grade, uh, they've got a big field event coming up uh, here shortly. Uh, their focus has been on balancing priorities, uh, preparing for college applications, taking their college research seminar course, uh, meeting with counselors to really uh, clarify what kind of test prep they need to do in this in this odd environment where we've had a lot of test optional movement among colleges and universities of choice. And finally, this spring, our 12th grade class of 2021 graduating very soon. Uh, they had a neat ninja nation event that was optional for seniors to show up and work on some challenges. Uh, they've been focusing on capstone research projects, humanities and tech capstone projects together, uh, building out the legacy of peak to peak, video announcements, daily announcements, uh, it's been really fun to see them uh, come together as a class. It's been a super tough year, but I think they've found a way to uh, define their own ethical compass and directions going forward. Finishing up, uh, a couple of highlights we had this spring with our, our high school uh, internal student climate survey. Uh, we implemented it, uh, as I've said before, the very end of March. Um, and uh, it showed very positive gains across nearly every indicator. Students reported to feel is celebrated by staff, uh, encouraged to participate in their courses across the board, celebrated for their efforts and connected with trusted adults at school. Really need to see those gains. Uh, more students say, uh, reported the feeling safe from bullying, secure that groups are not targeted for harassment in our school as a place where they feel like they can really, be, really belong. Um, uh, as we disaggregated results, uh, minority groups overall uh, come in slightly lower than the average, feeling a little less safe than the average. So that's a priority for us for next steps and looking at um, how do we get more of uh, an equity lens and voice to our different student groups who feel like they may not be as heard. Um, fewer students reported using substances, feeling down or depressed, uh, and or getting involved in, in suicidal ideation or self-harm activities. That's very, very positive, thank goodness. Uh, and really, the biggest highlight is we're all looking forward to a great return for in-person learning next fall. Thanks very much. Hi, this is Sam Todd. I'm the Executive Director of Operations at peak to peak and I'm excited to give you some operations highlights um, of what's happening here at peak to peak We're going to start with facilities. And the biggest project happening this summer is a team teaching classroom being created by removing a wall between two classrooms in the high school on the first floor. In addition, we are renovating the elementary playground asphalt area. Uh, we've added some new equipment in that area and we're either replacing the asphalt uh, or adding new concrete. Uh, that decision has not been made yet. In response to the COVID pandemic, we installed needlepoint bipolar ionization technology in all of our rooftop air handling units. Uh, these units kill the COVID virus. And in addition, we added air purifiers to every classroom uh, and office on campus. Innovative furniture is also being installed in three middle school and three high school classrooms this summer. And failing concrete by the music building and along the North Dr Drive will be uh, replaced this summer. In addition, we're uh, adding some new equipment to the auditoria this summer. In human resources, our employee opinion survey continue to show high levels of satisfaction. Each dimension averaged greater than 3.75, which equates to a very favorable rating. And we had 86% participation. The average teacher salary for this year was just over 65,500. We're projecting it to increase to 67,500 in 21-22. Our workers comp experience mod is at an all-time low of 0.67, and it's saving the school over 10,000 in premiums. Unfortunately, the pandemic brought out the worst in some people. We found over 30 fraudulent unemployment claims 
uh, have been claimed at peak to peak. Uh, they've all been rejected. Uh, these all came from outside sources who have uh, found compromised personal data. We are implementing a new non-exempt support staff pay structure this year uh, with scales, and it will increase our starting pay rate to $14.40 an hour. In food services, obviously the, the pandemic has had a major impact on this program. We've not been able to serve students in the cafeteria all year. However, the USDA did approve reimbursements for all students who voluntarily participate in our food pickup program. Uh, this has resulted in about 75,000 in reimbursement revenues, and we're feeding between 200 and 400 meals a day uh, by pickup only. We do anticipate losing about $150,000 in this program, but anticipate that the losses will largely be covered by federal ESSER funds. On the financial front, the school retained its triple B plus credit rating from Standard & Poor's with a stable outlook. And we're now um, among a handful, maybe three or four charter schools in the country to retain this high of a credit rating. The pandemic took a toll on the state economy, which resulted in a 5.5% cut in our per pupil revenue. Uh, this resulted in a reduction of over 700,000 in our budget this year. Fortunately, over 700,000 in federal coronavirus relief funds and elementary and secondary education relief funds was received from the federal government to help cover those losses. If we look at our projected revenues and expenses, uh, we're looking at total revenues of 18 million and expenses of 16.9 million, which is 94% of budget, while it, revenues are looking at 98% of budget. In food services, we're looking at revenues of 124,000 or 44% of budget and expenses of 340,000 or 78% of budget. And in our operations and technology fund, we're anticipating revenues of just shy of 1.5 million, which is 100% of budget, and expenses of 1.67 million, which is 94% of budget. We had planned to overspend this budget this year, or this fund this year, because we had built up substantial reserves in that fund. For 21-22, the state has recovered very well from the pandemic. And as a result, our PPR will be increasing 9.1% in 2122 to $8,766 per student. The mill levies from Boulder Valley School District are decreasing just under 1% to $3,643 a student. Enrollment will remain flat at 1,445 students, which is the maximum allowed by our contract. We are substantially increasing pay for our hourly support staff, approximately 15 to 17%, and salaried staff will be receiving a 5% pay increase for 21-22. As mentioned, the average teacher's salary is increasing from 65.5 to 67.5. And we have $385,000 of capital projects budgeted in the 21-22 budget. Our financial reserves will move above 160 days cash on hand. If you look at these charts, it shows you a comparison of revenues from 2021 to 21-22. And as you can see, it's slightly over a million dollars difference. Uh, that's with the cut we took in 2021 and the large increase we're expecting in 21-22. Uh, it doesn't change the mix of where those revenues are going largely. Um, 
In, in 2021, our PPR comprised 64% of the budget. Uh, mill levies were 22%. Uh, other BVSD funding, 7%. Local revenues, 5%. And capital construction funding was 2 In 21-22, we're looking at PPR taking a bigger chunk of our budget at 67%. Mill levies dropped to 20%. Other BVSD funding drops to 4%. Uh, local revenues rebound with the addition of athletics and activities revenues, as well as student fee revenues that we did not collect this year. That will be at 8%, and capital construction remains consistent at 2%. If we look at the expense side, we can see that we're increasing almost 2 million. Uh, in expenses from 2021 to 2122. Uh, so we're going from 16.9 million to 18.9 million. Uh, and that's uh, because we anticipate some additional federal funding, as well as the large increase in PPR has allowed us to increase our expenditures. Uh, so instruction is the biggest uh, portion of our expense budget at 60% in 2021, followed by administration at 15%, facilities at 1%, debt service 9%, local programs 3%, and capital expenses at 2%. And then our purchase services from Boulder Valley comprised 11% in 2021. In 21 22, Instruction uh, is 59%, admin is 14%, facilities remains at one, debt service drops a point to 8%, local programs increase a percentage point to four, capital expenses stay at two, and purchase services increase 1% to 12%. If we look at our fundraising, while it was a difficult year in the in in the fact that we could not have any fundraising events, uh, our parents were still very generous to the school. And we anticipate that our net fundraising uh, will be about 591,000. Now, a big chunk of that is driven by the success of the stock market and how our scholarship fund fared in that. Uh, so we saw a substantial increase in our investment earnings in the scholarship fund, which represents 50% of that net fundraising. The annual fund, uh, which we raised more this year than we have uh, in any previous year, comprised 36% of that. Ongoing fundraising, uh, 5%, and other donations, 1%. So we're looking at annual gift, uh, expecting to net at 216,000. Our ongoing fundraising efforts, which includes um, the sale of Spiritware, uh, our, our Safeway and King Supers gift cards, Amazon uh, gift cards, where people have put in uh, their information so that these companies give money back to the school. Other donations came in at 5,000. There were no events, as I mentioned. Scholarship fund donations uh, are going to be about 15,000. And the investment income on the scholarship fund was almost $380,000. We did pay out 41,000 in scholarships and we awarded four $3,000 four-year scholarships to, to grads this year. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for taking the time to listen through our presentation. And we wanted to take a moment to recognize our board members for their service. Both Elizabeth Gable and Thomas Willetto have been invaluable members of the board and we have appreciated their service for many years and we are sad to see them go, but know their legacy will remain moving forward. Moving on to our election details, there will be three open board of director seats, two three-year terms and one two-year term. Electronic voting only this year, no paper ballots.
The virtual candidate forum is tonight, May 5th from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. We would love to have all that can be in attendance. Voting begins immediately thereafter at 8.30 p.m. tonight, May 5th, and runs through May 12th, which ends at 11.59 p.m. The election committee who is holding the election includes Lisa Sticker, Robin Axelrod, Evelyn Grady, Tina Christ, Ethan Miley, Kaisha Schneider, Tracy Scholenweis, and Julie Shin. The Board of Director candidates include Brian Boonstra, Marlene Butis, Todd Durking, Steve Gibson, Shirag Shah, Christopher Vincent, and David Wu. Thank you again for your wonderful support of our community this year. It has been a challenging year, but like all of the Puma spirit, we get through this together and we look forward to the future.